it. It's the energy that's there, you know, the commitment to work. It's like, you know, as a teacher, Kevin probably can relate to this. I taught for 25 years in high school. Oh, and wow. The first question the kids would ask me is, are you an artist? I said, well, I'd be really remiss if I wasn't an artist and I'm trying to teach art. You have to experience what you teach. Say that again, and, uh, man. Yeah, uh-huh. you know, so you know, I admire a- Kevin because he, he never stopped and he kept pushing, pushing, you know, the art side. Uh, I have a lot of respect for him. Do you teach or, or you just work? Yes, sir. Studio? This is this is your 26 for me. Good for you. It's an honorable just ex- profession. I was just explaining to Miss Spitzner that um, I had um, Murphy's Law kind of happen to me between my internet went down last night, the power went out at my house this afternoon, wow. and my principal was nice enough to let me, they lock up the building at six because of we're doing you know, limited kids here, COVID. He was nice enough to let me, uh, when I told him what was going on, he's like, no problem. You do what you need to do. And then I'll send the custodians when you're done to come lock up. So you're doing all in person or you're doing hybrid? We started hybrid this week. We had been doing online up until about a week ago when we started this week. And so, and we're doing both at the same time. You know, I just read a report that the RAN uh, research institute gave out and they said three out of four um teachers said that they're stressed out and oh yes yeah, because so. of co- because of covid in since march of 2020 50 percent have quit mm-hmm. and yep. some were willing Sounds to come hard. back if everybody's vaccinated but the three 75 percent of all teachers feel they're stressed and, uh, you know, I was talking to some students uh, getting their uh, certification for art education at Temple last night. Hmm. And uh, I told them, I said, you know, if you don't enjoy the subject matter that you are teaching, you're going to be more easily stressed out. I mean, teachers have to have a certain degree of satisfaction, you know, yeah. passion and energy yes, for the subject they're teaching. Yes, and sir. Art teachers can easily do that, you know, because they can go to the studio. Now, if you teach literature, you can go write poetry, you can go read books, but you're in it, you know, if it's history, you know, uh, but so many people give up their craft and focus on, you know, pedagogy and, and just teaching, you know. But yeah, like, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I can't imagine, I, you know, you can't teach what you don't know, so. I couldn't imagine teaching and not making work. But you and Ke- Kevin, you still in the classroom? No, I retired in t- 2016. Congratulations, okay. sir. Yeah. Well, it's it's a real loss because there's so few black males that are teaching in schools. And, you know, access to role models is always important. I wouldn't yep. be an artist today if I didn't have role models that exactly. pointed me towards a career in art, you know? So, you know what, I, I, you know what, I, I, I always tell the story that, that I wanted to be, I, I wanted to be a welder and a bricklayer. I figure I, I, I can make, I can make enough money in the summertime that lasts me all winter. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. That's how John Bigger started out, you know. Really? He was going to be a plumber. Oh, well. And we, then he had, and the, it, at Hampton, he was studying to be a plumber. And uh, I can't remember his name, the great art historian from Germany. Lowenfeld, Lowenfeld, Victor Lowenfeld it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He told yeah. him, he's, and, and this is kind of like in John's words, it's like, son, you need to give up that plumbing. You need to be an artist. You could be an artist. And then Lowenfeld went from Hampton to Penn State University. Yeah. And Biggers followed him there. He got his degree at Hampton, switched over to fine art, mm-hmm. and went to um, Penn State. I think he got his master's there because I know he got his doctorate there. Yeah, he got his PhD there. And he was one of the very first in the country to get a doctorate in, fine, in, in, in art education. Right. Um, and that's what he did. And then he went to Southern University in Houston and set up the art program there. 
you know, but it took that one person. And Samara Lewis will tell you, it was Elizabeth Catlett. Catlett yeah. She studied with Catlett at Xavier University in New Orleans. And that was her mentor, you know, and look at all the people that Samara Lewis has mentored, you know, yeah. so. Okay. I think we're, I ready we're ready to get started. Okay. All right, I'll just say yeah. a couple words. So um, uh, welcome to everyone in the class and anyone who is watching us on YouTube. Um, I asked you both to eat. please ask um, questions and make comments in the chat and I'll be watching both the Zoom and YouTube chats. Um, I also wanna thank the SU Art Museum for hosting us on YouTube. And I especially want to thank Dr. Sharif Bey and Dr. James Rowling for suggesting this panel and also helping to make it happen. Um, next week, we're working with the Urban Video Project, um, and there will be a film screening and Q&A with uh, some experimental works by Louis Arneas, Simon Liu, and Zhao Tao. Um, and the program, uh, the videos all sort of show these ambiguous scenes and landscapes. They're a little bit uneasy, but I, they're sort of a metaphor for a lot of the feelings we've had this year. Um, I'm honored to introduce my colleague, Dr. James Rowling, who will be moderating tonight's discussion. Uh, Dr. Rowling is the head of our arts education program here at Syracuse University. He's also the president of the National Art Education Association and the author of a lot of things, several books, and including most recently, Growing Up Ugly, Memoirs of a Black Boy Daydreaming. Um, Dr. Rowling, I turn the evening I'm gonna stop my share. Uh, I turn the evening over to you and thank you so much and welcome everyone. Well, thank you, uh, 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 Joanna, for uh, having uh, us and for uh, arranging this and being in the organizer. Uh, I also thank uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Shreve Bay for suggesting uh, this uh, format. Uh, I'll say real quickly, because I wanna jump into this and allow uh, our guest uh, speakers uh, who are um, all uh, um, distinguished, uh, and I'm going to allow them to, to introduce themselves in order to save time, but I'll just say real quickly that I'm a former elementary school art teacher. I started off uh, with my MFA many, many moons ago here at Syracuse University. I started off my life as an artist, grew up in a household with an art studio in the middle of it. My father was an artist as well. Um, and one of the reasons why this uh, Form this 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 discussion is especially meaningful to me is because uh, I don't know that I I would have become an artist and an art educator someone who I, I consider myself a creativity educator um, if I didn't have the role model in my own home because I didn't have much in the in schools growing up um, of other male artists uh, of color and so. Uh, I'll say also that uh, part of one of the reasons why we've gathered this particular uh, group of gentlemen is because they are not only artists, but arts educators, arts advocates, and uh, you'll see that in their discussions. And so what I'm going to do in terms of this format is I'm going to allow uh, some time for each uh, of our guests uh, uh, to, to uh, um, share about their own art practice their own uh, 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 work, and then we'll have some time to discuss, uh, uh, have a conversation amongst us all. And our guests today are Kevin Cole, Stephen Cozart, and Alan Edmonds. And we're going to start first with, uh, I'm going to switch to my sc uh, screen share. I'll start first with the work of Kevin Cole. He'll introduce himself. And then uh, as when his presentation is done, uh, we'll go on to Stephen Cozart, and then finally it'll be the work of Alan Edmonds, and then we'll have a, a group discussion. If we have time for questions at the end, we'll we'll try to squeeze those in as well. So let me share my screen. Uh, here we go, and everyone should be able to see this. And uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Kevin to introduce himself. Okay, yeah, I, I just want to thank you all for inviting me. My name is Kevin Cole. I did my undergraduate at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Um, I got a master in art education from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, and a master of fine arts in drawing from Northern Illinois University. I uh, taught in the Fulton County School District in, in Atlanta, as well as Georgia State University and SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to try to go through these slides fairly quickly. The the uh, the uh, the image on the right is a, is an image of me, which I'm working on a series called the New Jim Crow, and I'm fortunate that I have three great assistants, and the young man on the far left at the bottom has been with me since he was in the sixth grade. He's now 44 years old. N next slide. So when people ask me about my work, I tell them that my work is about these issues. Number one, a story my grandfather told me. Number two, two events that changed our, two and three, two events that changed our lives forever. September 11th, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, the relationship between sight, sound, and color. I listen to music as I work. Number five, uh, relationships with my, my friends and my professors. And now, the, 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 I'm sorry, the coronavirus and the death of George Floyd. Next slide. This is the image of when I graduated from high school, I didn't want to go to register to vote. My grandfather was 91 years old. He took me to a tree where African American was lynched by their neckties on their way to vote. This is an image that took place about five miles from his property. So, so you would always see the necktie image in my work. He talked about the idea how they would take the, the necktie of, of the men and wrap, wrap it around the rope. And you notice most elder people, they consider it a privilege to go vote. So what they do is they actually dress up to go and vote. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is the image of of uh, of, uh, of New York City. I was supposed to be in New York on sept September 11th. Uh, a friend of mine invited me by the name of Eric Mack. That week, I decided I wasn't going to go. So Eric took a picture of a little boy holding a piece of aluminum and tar paper. So I started working on aluminum and tar paper as my protest against September 11th. N next image. And this is a picture of a uh, of the um, of the of uh, of New Orleans. I had a lot of frat brothers who lived in in uh, in New Orleans, and this was a part of Hurricane Katrina. I was going back and forth with them, and so I collected a lot of, of the debris. And then I started a series which uh, was called Fragments of Frozen Sound, where I mapped the path path of the storm. Next image. And this is when I say relationship. I graduated from Historically Black College, my undergrad. These four men, John Howard, Terrence Corbin, uh, Henry Linton, Ernest Davis, and they were the guys that changed, that changed, changed my life, and they were the ones responsible for me becoming an artist. Next image. And, and we, uh, for a number of days, these are the events that we watch happen. And uh, I think the, the, the virus was somewhat a blessing in, 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 in disguise when you look at it, because um, while watching TV, these images that stayed, stayed on TV for a, a, um, a large amount of time. Next image. Okay, this was part of my, my work. I, I wouldn't say it's political, I always say it's social. Uh, this was a part of my graduate thesis show at, at Northern Illinois University. I was teaching in a boys club and I had never heard of a drive-by shooting. So the students would come in talking about different students um, that, that had been killed in drive-by shooting. And uh, I, I like to tell the story that, that when I was hanging the show at about two o'clock in the morning at the Student Center Gallery in, um, in Northern Illinois, the vice pre uh, one of the vice president of Johnson Johnson Products, he came in and he saw the show and then he thought that these were actual real clothes. When I explained to him the concept, he, uh, he, he looked at the work and he said, I tell you what, um, I want to buy these pieces. And he said, no, I want this whole wall. And I said, sir, if this is the joke, I don't think it's funny. The exhibition sold out, out before it opened. Next slide. So I moved to Atlanta and I said, stated earlier, I listened to music. Um, one of my favorite artists was Prince. And I did a series called Signs of the, Signs of the Times. This was my first public art commission. Um, I, there were over a, a 198 artists applied and I was blessed to, to get the commission. And so I wanted to do a piece that would address issues should be involved in City Hall. It's for the new Atlanta City Hall building. Okay, next image. So I noticed that there were a lot of businessmen walking in and out, out of City Hall. Next image. Now, what the main one I was concerned about was I wanted to create a piece that the city councilman that they should be concerned about. And in Atlanta, in Atlanta area at that time, 75% of the kids were coming from public housing. 85% mm -hmm. of those kids came from one parent homes. 75% of those kids, they would go back into public housing because because that was the it was it was like a revolving door. And so if you notice out of all the images, these are the ones that don't don't have feet. And the ribbons and bowls were symbolic 
to the gift that we were accepted from South Africa. N next image. <clears throat> and then you have a book bag, the book light bag is empty and it, and it symbolizes that, that, that there is no money for education. Next image. And then at the end, there's the silhouette of a boy and a girl holding the American flag, which symbolizes hope. Okay. And the piece was called Sign of the Times, the Day Legenda. It won the 1990 Urban Design Award for Public Art. And it's funny because a lot of city council, before I talked about it, I was getting rave reviews. And then when I talked about it, I don't think they liked it too well. <laughs> Next <laughs> image. Okay, so anyway, so the Atlanta had won the 1996 Olympics. This was in 1994. So they wanted to find a way to welcome the world to Atlanta. So they came up with the idea of the Coca-Cola Company that they wanted to sponsor uh, the unsung heroes. And they wanted somebody to do a 15-story mural for the Olympics. How do you do a 15-story mural and never touch the wall? Well, what I did, I did my research. I went in my, when I did my presentation, I told them how many days it rained in Atlanta from 1990 to 1994, how many days it snowed, how many days it was over 40 degrees, how many days it was over 80 degrees. I said, there's no way that you can have somebody hanging from a scaffold creating these faces. And so um, I gave them an idea of a person who, I could do it on a, on a contact paper. I gave them uh, the name of a person who can install it. Next image. So, but anyway, one of the, my incentive was one of the vice president kept saying, but can he paint faces? I made a 40 foot banner saying, but can he paint faces? <laughs> Next image. So then I'm, uh, I made them hire some of my former students and several young artists to bring them along for the ride and give them the experience. Next image. Okay, next image. Now I'm 5'10", so you notice how tall each face is, but they are done on, in four by eight strips. They were taped on the back. Okay, next image. So this was phase one. I would do the painting uh, in, in the studio and they would go up and install it and I would talk to them by cell phone on how to install it, next image. Phase two, and every every three months, faces would appear on this wall, okay? Next image. So phase three, okay, next image. Phase, phase four, next image. Phase five, and this is the final product. It took me two years, six months, 17 days, 14 hours, and 30, 32 minutes. <laughs> next image. So then um, Miss Kelly, this image of a little bit Kelly and I, we had a piece within the same building. Um, so um, I did a, a series on, 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 on African-American women. Okay, next image. I was doing a um, visiting artist at the Des Moines Arts Center in Des Moines, Iowa. And I was teaching a group of 11 year old and I asked them to name one major African-American female who had made major contributions to America. The only one they could name was, was Oprah Winfrey. So I had them do, do images, uh, uh, research papers on Elizabeth Catholic, Catherine Dunham, Billie Holiday, a number of other African-American women. And inside those time capsules are their research papers. And we listened to music by, by Sweet Honey and the Rock. And the series was called For the Sisters Who Carry the Burdens of Other Sisters. Next image. Then I, I started this series, I, I started using aluminum and I was getting ready to, to do, uh, make these eight feet tall and Michael Jordan ex-wife, she, she ended up buying them before I can do them. I hope for one day I, I'll be able to do them. I wanna make them at least eight feet tall where you can walk in, in, in and out of them. In the next image. Okay. So, if so, fast forward the um, the Alabama Historical Society commissioned fifteen artists to do a piece on on the fiftieth anniversary of the Freedom Riders. I noticed where every place they would go, there would be a series of lynchings. Florida lynched the most women. Alabama did the most group lynchings, and Arkansas and, and Mississippi had the most lynchings. And I'm I'm from from Arkansas. Next image. And then so we're teaching in a magnet program at Westlake High School, a lot of parents, they would send their kids to my school because it was a, it was a magnet program. And also we had the highest number of active NFL players. So I don't know if you know, but, but, but a one out of 88,000 become a professional athlete. So I did these series called the New Nooses. And they expressed, they, they expressed the, the concept of sports and, and jails and, and, and education.
Okay, next image. This is a piece that was that was purchased by the Smithsonian, the, the, the New Museum of African American History and Culture. It's called Increased Wish with, with Emotional Faith. It was from my fragment of Frozen Sound series where I was doing a series of mapping and I'm bending wood. You know, every, every piece that I do has to do with the concept and the idea. When you think about wood, you think about African American being lynched. So I'm actually bending wood. Next image. This is a this was one of my professors, Terrence Corbin, who was very influential in, in, in my life. And uh, I want to show the next image as an image of his work. The, this is an image of his work. Okay. Next image. So when he was making his transition, he kept saying, Do Lord remember me? So I did a series of installations uh, of these ladders called Jacob Ladders. Mm -hmm. And it was an installation paying homage to him and what he meant to me as an artist and, 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 and as an educator, okay? Then I started a series called My Blanket Series. I was fortunate enough in 2003, I received the National Art Education uh, Southeastern Region uh, Regional Art Educator of the Year. And I was out in Denver and I, and I saw this tapestry show, which reminded me of, of my mom used to be a housekeeper. So everything was folded and stacked and the, the rods symbolized my cane. So I'm sorry, symbolized the cane that my grandfather used when he kneeled down and drew in the, drew in the sand and told me to go stand beside these trees. So you still see the necktie and the scarf shaped images at the bottom, okay? This was a, a commission that I just completed in 2017. Uh, the the um, Atlanta International C C Concourse, which is, was the name I, um, Atlanta first uh, black mayor, uh, Maynard Jackson. And I went to the airport for, for, for seven days. I asked people from 38 different countries, what are some of the most uh, important words that they use in their family? And, and the, these words that they came up, faith, family, love, friends, hope, dreams, and peace. So this is the marquette for the peace. I took the seven continents and I abstracted them at, at the top and I, I, I left them the way that they are at the bottom. Okay, so so this is the, the the wall. Okay, next image, and so this is the image. It, it's twenty feet by fifty five feet by twenty four inches, and I right now I'm the only uh, American artist in this concourse. Okay, so the, 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 that's a top view. Well, then I was doing a commission for um for a client. And I noticed uh, a client lived in Arkansas, a, a doctor by the name of Dr. Alonzo Davis. And I had never heard of the Lane riots that took place in, 19, in 1919. And, and it was the, in, in 2019, it was the 100 year anniversary. And I found out that there were a group of black men who rebelled against a group of white sh sharecroppers. And, and one of the white sharecroppers um, got into an altercation with one of the black men and he was killed. And so I started to look at the, at, at the map and create shapes and wrap the neckties around these shapes, okay? And these were the four men who was, well, I'm sorry, these were the 12 men who was finally acquitted of the thing, but there were over, over 300 African-Americans killed in this altercation, okay? And this guy was, was interested, his name, his name was Afonso Banks Jr. And when he took the stand, he had been beaten and 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 he was asked to ask the question, a couple of questions, and and he took off his shirt and said, "My uh, uh, my my scars are my testimony." Mm. The next image. So I did this piece called "When My Scars Are My Testimony," and this was a commission for the Atlanta Biannual in 2019. Is on aluminum. Um, all the those holes are where a lot of the lynching took place and they would, uh, they would actually use a lot of distractions uh, before they lynched the African-American, okay? And this is a series I, st I just started doing. I was so upset about G G George Floyd. I uh, started to do this piece, pieces called The New Jim Crow. Mm. And these are images that I think they speak for themselves. N -n -n next image. And so then I did a series of prints called The Ghosts of Jim Crow. Okay, next image. 
And, th and this is the, the uh, my last public art commission I just completed for the Henry Ford uh, Cancer Center in Detroit. Um, there was a, a lady by the name of Birgit Harris. I was doing research on her. And they asked me to do a piece in, uh, about, about, about her. So I started doing my, my research on it, make a long story short. Uh, she was a, a lady who supported the Boys Club, the Detroit Symphony, and other areas. Okay, next image. And this is the actual piece. It's called Shared Blessing with Shared Visions. It's 87 by 326 inches by 22, and it's on etched aluminum. I hope I stay within my time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we're going to now, uh, 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 and uh, very uh, compelling work. I'm going to now switch to the next uh, speaker who will also introduce himself, the artist uh, and educator, Stephen Cozart. Uh, so I'm going to uh, move to the next slide. It should be all queued up. There we go. And uh, I'll let uh, Stephen introduce himself. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, quite honored to be here. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Mr. Cole, just want to say powerful stuff. Uh, Steve Cozart, I am an uh, elementary school, high school art teacher uh, for the last 26 years. And it was funny, right before we all started, we were having a, a conversation. And I believe it was Mr. Evans that stated that you can't teach what you don't do. So I've always considered it uh, uh, necessary to have a practice. So I've always exhibited, I've always made work. And as of late, it started to kind of take shape and form. Next slide, please. So the next slide that you'll see is a video to kind of, I feel like it more or less is a good introduction to encapsulate some of the things that I've been working on. By the time I was seven, I figured I might not make it to 14. When I hit 14, I said, okay, I made it to 14, 21. I might not be around at 21. Our lives are throwaways. In order for that to happen, you have to see something. All of a sudden, we're we're dangerous and dangerous enough to, to justify lethal force. So you don't see a face. You see some mythical character, some superhero. This river, this current of conjecture that supersedes our humanity. And it's ironic because they're both saying that we're less than and more than at the same time. Right. So that's why I think these conversations have to happen. We have to be aware of our history. We have to know that there's some separation and that even if we do it subtly, we're reinforcing it. Every statement is a reinforcement. Every lighthearted joke that wasn't meant to hurt anyone ends up being part of your psyche. People from the neighborhood would come and get their cars worked on. And I was maybe eight, nine years old. One of the gentlemen standing in the yard, he saw two lines of ants. He saw a line of red ants and a line of black ants. And he kind of elbowed me, and I think he thought he was telling a joke. You see that boy? You see the red ants, see the black ants? The black ants are nigger ants. See the red ants don't want to mix with them? So at eight, nine years old, next slide, please. And so that is an introduction to the body of work that I've started several years ago, around 2011. And it's taken, it's taken on many forms and shapes, but I finally settled, settled on codex within the African-American community. Next slide, please. So a codec is a device or program that compresses data. It's actually a, an IT term. Uh, I'm sure that there's some sort of codec program going right now as we're watching video, right? Something that's going to compress data so that you can uh, quickly transfer from one spot to another spot. Well, the side effect of that is that there's such a thing called lossy compression. So when you compress that data, there is data that is irreversibly lost. What strikes me, next slide please, is that we do this. Even though this is some 
IT thing that is came on with the advent of computers. This is just normal human nature for us to see something, to compress data, and then to move forward with that data and make assumptions. And in the compression of that data, we lose things. Mm -hmm. So that brings up the conversation of colorism in the paper bag test. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a painting of my father. This idea started, um, like I said, about seven or eight years ago. And it was based on something that my mother had told me about the paper bag test, where African-Americans were compared to a paper bag, their skin tone. And depending on whether you were lighter or darker, that determined, you know, certain privileges, social circles, social acceptance, that sort of thing. Um, next slide, please. And so this is my mom. Uh, she had told me about this since I was a little boy. And so like we, you know, human nature, I assumed that everyone knew about this and I was kind of surprised to find out that everyone did not, but everyone understood the spirit of the letter of it. Next slide, please. Um, so as I began to do this work and began to exhibit it more, uh, a, a very nice thing happened. Uh, this is uh, Justin. Justin is a former student at the high school I teach at here in Greensboro, North Carolina, Weaver Academy, who saw a show where I displayed some of my paper bag series. And he's, he wasn't a student of mine. I'm at, a, I'm at an arts high school. He was a theater major. I did not know who he was. He just came up to me when they said, I saw your show. I really like, I just want to talk. And so we talked. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another student who saw the show. Another, I think she's a vocal major. Um, she was actually going through some things in regard to some self-loathing in regard to her skin tone, her hair texture. And it was suggested by someone else in my school that she go see the show. She saw the show and then she came to find me to talk to me. And next slide, please. Everyone is letting me interview them, okay? So I'm interviewing my subjects and I'm recording the interviews and that ends up being my source material. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, uh, I'm interviewing family, I'm interviewing friends, I'm interviewing students, I'm interviewing anyone to just see what their thoughts are. And every interview starts with the same question. Have you heard of the paper bag test? And like I said, some people had heard of it. Some people had no idea what it was. But when I described what it was, every African-American I spoke to, they may not have heard of the test, but they knew what it meant. So uh, Kurt Gill is a 20 years my senior. He's one of my mentors, he retired a few years back. He's a production teacher. We always talked about these things. And so he let me tape him and get his interview. Next slide, please. Um, this is another uh, artist who I've collaborated with, Trey Wilkes. Um, and these are all, by the way, on paper bags. Um, the image is drawn or painted onto the paper bag. Um, and like I said, I, I'll take these interviews and I'll um, transcribe what, what's said to me and include some of the more interesting statements as part of the imagery. Next slide. Um, this is uh, the young lady who was in the other painting, um, Odira Tate, who this was what she shared during her interviews. Um, one of the things that I noticed that was interesting that happened during the interviews was people felt very comfortable. They let their guard down. They spoke very, very uh, honestly with me and openly with me. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then, of course, that's a uh, young man from earlier, Justin Harrington. Um, who came in, we sat down, we talked a lot. Um, actually, I was, this is a few years back and we're still in touch to this day. Um, and there, um, I noticed that a lot of the students were talking about their experiences right around, you know, that adolescence age, thir 12, 13, 14, middle school, that age. Um, next slide. And Justin was so excited about it because we had, really started to kind of bond and we kind of he would if he had frustrations he would come talk to me um and of course all that wasn't taped it was just you know man-to-man -man conversation um he was so excited about it he pulled his mom in then he and mom started talking uh next slide and then mom talked to me and i actually got mom to sit down and so I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but notice that the bags are beginning to get bigger. The first one were like lunch bags. These are like grocery bags. 
So these are around 14 by 17. Um, and mom was beginning to reveal to me that she had to go through some things that her son had to go through, but she didn't think he would have to go through them. And she didn't know. Um, it wasn't until she saw, read the statements from my work that she was like, wow, I, I, did, I had no idea. Next slide, please. And you know, this next one is just her stating that. Um, just as a side note, one of my inspirations, uh, believe it or not, I'm very eclectic in the work that I like. And when I was doing this, um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of, uh, there's a, uh, an author named Harvey Picar who created a comic in the 80s called American Splendor. Uh, next slide, please. Where he, um, he basically told stories about his everyday life, but he wrote in a comic book fashion. So the, the trick was, how do you create a comic book that you're used to comics having all this action and there's explosions and, and these mythical characters that have powers? How do you make that interest when it's just about everyday life? And so that was a huge inspiration for making these statements. Uh, again, you'll notice that I stick with the same subjects a lot um, because people have a lot to unpack. And this is mom again. Um, mom told me a lot growing up. And then when I got her to sit down and take me, this is one of the things that she said, talking about the house Negro feel Negro concept that was made popular by uh, Malcolm X. And next slide, please. She was uh, someone who could have passed the paper, paper bag test in terms of uh, being closer to white, which may have been more acceptable. But in her case, she was the lightest person in her in her social circle when she was growing up as a as a kid as a preteen and it went the opposite way where she actually was chastised for it uh this is uh my principal uh, who i've been working with now for 11 years dr john carlos miller and we've had those conversations he's a uh, he's a big guy doctor skin guy we've had those conversations as well and just as a side note the um i had to say that didn't know I was going to make this. My power went out at home. My internet went out at home. I called this man. This man said, I told him what I was doing. He said, no problem. He actually unlocked the building for me. So I'm actually at my school because of him. He's been a great support. Um, and I also wanted to include, next slide, notice that the bags are now about three feet tall. They're getting bigger. Uh, this is actually a former student, another former student who I taught when he was 10 years old. And then I taught him again all the way through high school. He lived up the street. He still does. He's married with uh, just had a newborn son. We've always talked. And this has been a recurring conversation for him because his mother's African American and his father is Puerto Rican and very rooted into his culture, both cultures, and then just some of the struggles that he deals with. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide just kind of is a zoom in to about that statement um, about kind of feeling stuck between two worlds where for lack of a better term, he's not quite black enough for some of his African-American friends, but then on the other end of the spectrum, there are people of Hispanic descent who were insulted that he doesn't speak fluent Spanish. Um, it's just interesting. Uh, next slide. Some of the stories that came up. So, one of the things that began to happen is I noticed that it was a repeat of stories. Now, this is only scratching the surface. I have a lot of interviews. I tried to speak with as many different people as I could from as many different age groups as I could. But I started to notice some commonalities. And in particular, uh, I started my work has started to change in regard to thinking about African-American males and African-American females and some of the things we do. Uh, next slide. So that concept almost predates dealing with the uh, the paper bag test. And so this is actually a self-portrait. Um, I actually had my students help me make it. Um, I usually come to work, shirt and tie, that sort of thing. So I set up camera lighting here in my uh, computer lab and had one of the students shoot the reference. And I'm sorry, guys, I'll be right back. I'm gonna change clothes. I wanna shoot the other side. And they got, really got a kick out when I came out in the, the white tank top and the toboggan and shades and baggy pants and all that. Just 
that conversation because I'm very interested in some of the division that happens in our community and the root of it, because I believe if you get to the root of a thing, you can deal with that thing. You could eliminate that thing. Mm. Um, so sometimes it's a, it's a generational gap. Sometimes it's a socioeconomic gap. Sometimes it's a class gap. But there ends up being a gap within the community that I want to start talking about and investigate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in that, in being an African-American male, there's all these other things you end up balancing. Um, uh, Mr. Cole mentioned uh, George Floyd, and it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. And so that concept has always been there. Um, I, remember being, I remember how brokenhearted I was with Trayvon Martin, uh, Fernando Castile, mm -hmm. uh, Eric Garner. Uh, matter of fact, when I was working on this piece, it was over the summer. I was thinking about doing something. I you know, had this little kitschy idea that actually wasn't going in this direction. And I think I saw the Eric Garner clip on YouTube as it was being released. And it just struck me that he and I are the same age. Mm. And it just, it hit me. And so the idea of transcendental being, first of all, the you see the Iron Man mask. So people think you, for some reason, people have this notion that African-American men are somehow these mythical characters that you justify using this lethal force against. Um, I always feel like I have a target on me. This is another self-portrait. Um, and then what do you see? That's what the, the vision charts, the stilling charts are about. But then the largest stilling chart has the number pi on it, which is a transcendental number. Transcendental numbers are numbers in, or algebraic equations that have no solution. Because it seems like we can't come to a solution to stop killing African-Americans that, that I, I have no words. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, and then, of course, I'm kind of every time something happens, I'm working through that. I remember doing this piece. Um, it's, a, it's not a large piece. It's a self-portrait. Uh, it's actually coffee stained, uh, coffee stained board with charcoal. The target is actually a photocopy transfer. And I think I did the right thing because I had people who were not African Americans who were coming up to me telling me how much they disliked this. And when I said, why is it, is it not a good drawing? No, no, no. It's just, I, it, I, it doesn't, it, it's disturbing for me to see. And I think that's good. I, what the concern was the African Americans who saw it that were disturbed and said, yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying because you should never get used to that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another painting of uh, my mentor, Mr. Gill. Uh, one of the things that happened with African American males in particular is, and this is a conversation that has come up, has been lighter skinned African American males revealing that sometimes their manhood is questioned within the African American community. Um, not being seen as you know strong enough, hard enough, man enough. And so the idea, you'll notice that I've always got these uh, value scales. Um, and in particular, that one is actually a piece of paper, like a litmus test. Uh, the litmus test being the, the value of the skin, the tone of the skin. Next slide. This, is, this was kind of my George, George Floyd's response. I remember seeing that video and just being upset and going out to the studio. And I just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I, I thought I was going to make this drawing of him and I just, I couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to look at him. Um, I just felt so uh, so sad by what happened. And so this was m more my response. I wanted to turn it into something positive. Um, this is actually another former student uh, who posed for me. Um, this is on Mylar which is a kind of a transparent uh, film that you can draw and paint on. And then, of course, you'll see the repetition of the Snelling chart. Uh, next slide, please. And so to kind of close that out, like I was saying, um, there were a lot of conversations about manhood and what it means to be a man in the African-American community and what that looks like and some of the roles. 
um, and some of the unrealistic expectations. But then women started having conversations and it seems like in almost every interview I did, no matter what age, young to old, hair came up every single time. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is my daughter. Um, and by now I've really gotten into the, this, into the idea of codex. So the idea of that symbol where you can unpack things, uh, I don't know if you notice that the divide is actually the same as a division symbol. Um, and the scissors mean something because there are some African-American women who are upset with their, with their, with their sisters who decide to cut their hair. In particular, my daughter, I won't, we don't have time to go into the story, but my daughter decided to cut her hair short. My wife and I were like, great, do you, whatever you want to do, if you, if you like it, but then was met with disapproval by um, an ex-boyfriend's mother, she, uh, commented that, made a kind of an offhand comment, didn't understand why she would do such a thing, and told her, and I quote, oh, you're beautiful anyway. Next slide. Um, and then, of course, my daughter again, that same conversation about making a decision to do what you want to do, um, I think that is another conversation that happens not just with African American women, which I am trying to stay with, but women in general who are told what to do with their bodies, what to do with their hair. So to make a decision to do what you want to do. Um, acrylic and graphite, um, I've got some paintings, a lot of drawings because, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, I am a color deficient, which is like a form of color blindness. So I keep my paintings very limited, the palette very limited, so I can understand what I'm doing. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is a study that I, is actually in the studio right now that I'm working on about natural crown. This is another st former student who, one of the things that I try to do is as students are making work, I make work so that, you know, I, again, you can't teach what you don't know. And if I'm telling the kids that they need to be making sketches and doing the research and putting in the work, it's one thing for me to say it, but when they, but when they see me do exactly what I'm telling them to do, I feel that that gives a little bit more, gives a little bit more gravitas. So another former student um, talking about the pencil test, which I uh, don't know if anybody's heard of that one before, but if your, your hair is considered good hair, if, the, if you put a pencil in it and the pencil cannot stay, but if the hair can hold the pencil, it's quote unquote bad hair. Uh, you'll notice the uh, crown of thorns, um, just about, you know, being that's a symbolism or a codec for being mocked for your decisions about your hair. Uh, next slide. I, that may be the last one. Yeah. Ah. I hope I just like Mr. Cole, I hope I did not run over my time. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, and I'm going to now turn to our final uh, artist. Uh, and uh, this is the this is the work of oops work of Alan Edmonds, uh, who's also an arts advocate, and I'll let him uh, introduce himself and uh, then we'll move to our discussion. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Rollins, and thank you to the um, Syracuse Art Museum for hosting this. Uh, it's pretty tough to come behind these two gentlemen. Uh, I learned a lot from each one of them, and I think that's one of the values of working in the field of the arts. You can use visual imagery to share information, knowledge, experiences. And um, I have up on here my first slide, producing and sharing diverse art to connect, inspire, and build bridges among global communities. Because that is, that it, it's extracted from the mission of Brandywine Workshop and Archives, which I founded in 1972 uh, after getting my master's from uh, Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, it was a period, uh, 1971 to 72, things were happening fast for me. I was in major museum exhibitions and things and, you know, starting to sell some work and things were happening really fast. But it's been my commitment probably since ninth grade that I wanted to be an educator. And the reason for that was I was so inspired by the teachers that taught subjects, math and art, they were excited, they were passionate about what they were teaching. And I would have thrived in either Mr. Cole or Cozart's classroom 
because they demonstrate that kind of passion and love for what they're teaching. And that makes them also a role model. Kids follow that, they're inspired by that, I was. And so while I was planning to be a math teacher, my art teacher convinced me I needed to try art as well. So thank God I did and um, I had opportunities uh, to get early exposure, opportunities to travel widely. And while things were happening fast for me, I could only see opportunity. And I always tell people, you know, opportunity is only good if you seize them at that moment, if you can identify it as an opportunity. And I had an uh, idea that, and it, it was really inspired by Bob Blackburn, an African-American who started in 19, I think 48, the printmaking workshop in New York City. I had visited with him and was inspired by him. So I had my teachers for inspiration. And then I had Bob Blackburn who uh, tapped into my interest in the graphics. And uh, looking at his model, what he was doing in New York, New York, I felt that if I could build an organization, I could tap into my desire also to be relevant as a person coming out of the civil rights movement. Uh, a lot of the things that were addressed in the presentations by Kevin and Kozar, that their response to things happening in society and therefore inspiring them to respond visually, I looked at it as responding institutionally because I sat in front of the TV and watched Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream address. I sat in front of the TV when he was assassinated, when Kennedy was assassinated, John and Robert, when Malcolm X was assassinated. And my feeling was that to make sustainable change, you needed institutions because leaders are mortal. They die if they get a chance to live a long life and are not assassinated. Still, how long a life? But that if we can build institutions, and, and from my perspective, the only institutions we really had of substance in a black community were the businessmen and the churches and the businesses were funeral directors. These are the people that ran for political office because they were considered leaders in the community. We, in, in 1971, we didn't have many institutions. You know, Philadelphia, where I was born and raised, does not have a historically black college. The closest one is Lincoln University, about 30, 40 miles, or maybe a little more, maybe 50 miles outside of Philadelphia. But we didn't have the benefit of that. We didn't get to see a lot of professionals at a very high level. But one thing that art did for me, early exposure to people like Richard Hunt, Sam Gillian, Romare Beard, and Jacob Lawrence, Betty Catlett, early experience, I could look at their career and I could have something to model and to think about and to grow my ideas from. So producing and sharing diverse art to connect, inspire, and build bridges is Brandywine's mission, but it's also what I embody, I think, in my work. So let me move to the next slide. This is a slide where we were showing uh, Dr. David Driscoll, who passed away from COVID uh, in the early spring last year, one of the preeminent African-American art historians also an educator, in part because there weren't a lot of opportunities available to artists that wanted to pursue in the, in the Black community, wanted to pursue a profession. Inevitably, many of them started out in education. Uh, Dr. Driscoll was fortunate enough to start out in higher education, having taught at Fisk and Howard and University of Maryland. Uh, but to continue to pursue your work and bring that passion, that that experimentation, that newness, that experience back to your teaching, your art history, or your art education practice. Um, so that's why I put this slide here, just to show that, you know, it's so important if you're gonna be engaged in something to actually experience that which you're promoting. Next slide. At Brandywine Workshop, which was started in 1972, and I, I, I bring this into the conversation because I, I can't define myself as a person, as an artist, as an educator, an advocate, without looking at the institution that I've spent almost 50 years structuring and building and trying to keep growing. But as, as evidence of some of the outcomes and some of the products, I show these pieces because there's also you know, stories 
abound in, in much of the work that African-American artists do. This is a picture by Mayor Freelon Asante, who's in Durham right now, North Carolina. Originally from Philadelphia and her family is, is rich in, in heritage and African-American history and art. Uh, her father, Alan Freelon, was one of the designers of the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American Art. He passed away last year as well. But this is Alan Freelon's grandfather. Uh, this is Alan Freelon, the grandfather. And he had a mental breakdown during World War I when he was overseas in Europe. And as part of his recovery, somebody suggested he start creating art. Well, he did. And he became the first art supervisor, African-American art supervisor for the Philadelphia School District. So he has a legacy and his great granddaughter, Maya Freelon, took the family photograph and created this piece. Next to, to that one is by Deborah Willis, the uh, really distinguished, she's the head of the photography and digital media department at New York University. Um, but she's a Philadelphian. And when she was in undergraduate school, she was at the uh, Philadelphia College of Art, which is now the University of Arts. And there was a lot of prejudice towards Blacks and there was extra prejudice toward African-American women. And she got pregnant during her undergraduate years. And uh, when she told her professor, he said, well, you know, you just took the place of a good, good man, not even a good woman. I mean, this was a good man. She didn't belong there in the first place. And so she kept this photograph because this is when she was pregnant with Hank Willis Thomas, who's a really distinguished uh, major international artist now. So she titled this piece, I took the place of a good man, I made a place for a good man. And uh, she said, let me use this photograph from my archives. So now both of these come from family archives. So being able to mine that, and you'll see the connection in, in why I even pick these pieces to my own work, which I'll show you at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay. This is by Willie Cole, artist from North Jersey. Uh, is very active in the gallery scene in New York City um, and has worked a lot uh, in the community of, of North New Jersey. This is a piece where um, he took an iron and he found the, the blow up of the diagrammatic sketch of the iron. I forget the name of the iron, but it's a steam iron. And what he did, he, he does this kind of transformation a lot. Uh, he started out with irons, the kind that you heat on a flame and, you know, when it gets hot, you, you, you do the clothes, a lot of what, all that, that's all that was accessible to the slaves um, on the plantations that they would do the clothes and they would iron with these heavy metal iron. So as time advanced, we got the electric steam iron, but he takes the electric steam iron, he transposes it to look like antiquities from Africa. So that's what he's doing here. And then the, the background, the ocean is about the middle passage, you know, and the transformation from antiquities to, uh, uh, as he sees it, the, the, the uh, modern technology industrialization. So there's a story there. Okay? Go to the next one. Now, I introduced these because the story is more about the art and the aesthetics and less about a narrative. And I show them because I want people to understand that as African-American artists, we do a spectrum of styles, media, we're diverse. We're as diverse as the field is itself, embracing abstract expressionism, uh, like the piece by Sam Gilliam on the right, uh, or minimalist art, like the one by Odili Donald Odita on the left. We're diverse and we, and, and we explore all these things. Uh, Kevin's work is, is, has the abstract component, even though it has that strong narrative and symbolism that he does. And Steve has it as well, not as explicit as, 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 as Kevin's, but he deals with that. A lot of times I was listening to Steve, it's like these were abstract concepts because they were unknown. If you talk about 
the pencil test or the, or the bag test. I, I, I never heard of the pencil test, Steve, but I did hear, I did know about the bag test. It's like bringing these ideas into a visual realization or interpretation is, is really a, a, a strong aspect of what many African-American artists are doing today. Next slide, please. Okay, now process wise, why did I choose printmaking? Why was I so in touch with building an institution around printmaking? It was several reasons. One, it's collaborative. You engage youth and young artists in the process of making prints, particularly if the processes you use are the first. We started out with silk screen and photo silk screen and we got enough money, we bought offset lithography presses. And then when we got more money, we bought flatbed presses. And now we're working with um, CNC cutters, computer, computer numeric cutters that guide it. It's like you put an image into the computer and the cutter is guided by that, that file to cut these images. So if you look at a piece like this by Tim McFarlane, the Philadelphia painter, you see all these shapes and you say, my God, if that was printed, if that was hand cut, could it be as exact as that? So what happens is technology and digital tools enable us to conceptualize a little bit differently. We use those tools and we conceptualize differently and that makes this piece happen. Next slide, please. Again, and this is one of our printers. He's um, Alex Nutini. He's uh, Mexican-American. He is showing you a proof of a set of a, a monoprints we're doing for the painter, Sam Gilliam, who's an abstract expressionist artist. And Sam is known for his rich, colorful compositions, but he wanted to explore black and white as color. So uh, just to show you the kind of things that that we can do. Again, digital media, you take the color piece, you photograph it digitally, and then you separate it into color separations. And then you cut with the CNC cutter, you cut those separations, and then you start printing them. So technology enables this to happen and also happen at a, at a distance because Sam's not in full off your work and we do it by video or we do it by mail and shipping back and forth to proofs. So one of the things that I think the COVID pandemic has done with shutting down a lot of venues and making travel difficult is we've learned to be resilient. We've learned to try new things and that's a positive. Next slide. Okay, so as I said early on, my passion was, was educating, it was sharing, it was being diverse. Uh, when I say that, I mean it from all aspects engaging students, youth, young emerging artists, mid-career artists, and well-established artists. It involves Native American, African American, Asian American, Latinx, white American. It involves people from South America, Central America, Africa, Europe, Japan, South, South Korea, uh, because it, it's always been the notion that, you know, art is universal. Picasso started really blowing up and, and getting recognized when he looked at African art and started abstracting his compositions or Gauguin in, in Polynesia. Uh, it's no different today. John Biggers incorporated a lot of his imagery after he traveled throughout Ghana. Uh, African-American artists after the Second World War and the GI Bill enabled them to be able to go and travel. And many of them went back to Europe just like the writers and the dancers and the jazz musicians, they were more welcomed in Europe than they were in the United States. And so they made that journey and they brought back with them ideas. You know, Romare Bearden was a Cubist. I mean, he was making Cubist type paintings until he found his, his, his home with collage, you know. So when we look at it, we say, Brandywine has done all this work for the last 50, almost 50 years. And we were very much uh, committed to documentation. You know? So what do we do with all that? We put it in a database, we make it free and accessible to anybody, but we concentrate on education. And we have in our website called artour.org, we have a teacher's resource section. 
Now, this here is the cover page for the uh, teacher guide we issued last fall. It's free, it's downloadable at artour.org and it's 64 pages. It includes writings by some of the most distinguished African-American uh, poets and writers. And we pair that up with the imagery of African-American, Native Amer American, Latinx, Asian, and so forth. So we do this cross-cultural, cross-curricular presentation that would help people. Now, Kevin and, 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 and Steve, Mr. Cole and Mr. Kozar, they do their research, they're passionate, they bring that information to the classroom. But the, the reality is that the vast majority of people in the classrooms are not from that community. And so they, if they're gonna introduce it, where did they go find this information? So this is the first database or website of its type to be able to bring this information freely into the classroom. Um, and it's available to everybody. If parents are trying to teach the students at home, if students are looking for information because they've got assignments from school, um, this is um, a tremendous resource. And we're gonna be doing, Brandywine will be doing this every year. Next year, we'll focus on art and music, and then we'll focus on natural sciences. Um, this issue focuses on language arts, reimagining history, and math and art. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is my work. I put my work at the end because what I do as an artist is less important to me than what I do at Brandywine. Because I, you know, always look when I was in the classroom, you know, it was like the numbers, okay? How can you impact somebody? How can you be a role model? How can you inspire somebody to go beyond what the current environment tells them they can do? And uh, so a lot of times my students would ask me if, if I'm an artist. So I knew I always had to have evidence that, I, that I'm an artist, you know, and I take it serious. But since retiring in 1994, uh, after 25 years of teaching high school, I turned my, my creative commitment almost exclusively to the growth and development of Brandywine and making sure that artists that I felt in the, in, the, in the selection committee and all, we felt needed the opportunity to come to fill off and experience printmaking. And then as a result of that, get into collections through our satellite collections program at museums and, and heritage centers around the country. Well, for me, I've always worked in themes. When Mandela was still in prison in South Africa in the eighties, I did a, uh, a series on South Africa and apartheid. When I started, um, I was doing the Afrin War in Africa when I think it was Nigeria split and became two countries, Biafra and Nigeria. In the 80s, I started, my mother died and all the family records, the Fogwa albums and everything were turned over to me. So I became like the archivist for the Edmonds family. Uh, which includes two things, uh, the Edmonds from Fayetteville, North Carolina, and the Harrisons from Salisbury, uh, I mean, Fayetteville, Virginia, and the Harrisons from Salisbury, North Carolina. That's the heritage of my uh, two parents, although they were both born and raised in Philadelphia. So I took my family on a journey to visit the plantation and trace all that. Um, I had this trove of material and I made the commitment I was going to do the family album series both for the Edmonds and for the Harrison. This is one of the collages that I did for uh, my mother and father. This was really about my mother though because she took she used to have we don't have them today but it's black and white composition books where you go to elementary school and you write your notes in. She had one of those and she took copious notes on when somebody was born when the teeth first teeth came in, when they did this, when they graduated, won the award at school. And I like this first person, the authentic use of the writing, rather than me writing something, to use their writing and bring that into it. So you had an image, which you could translate many different ways, but you also had specific writing. And I connected 
the imagery or composition to that writing. So that's a theme that I continue today. Uh, as I got married, raised my own family and now have grandchildren, uh, it's something that I will keep doing, but it's been a series created out of collage and out of prints. Next to that one is a print that I did in collaboration with the poet Sonia Sanchez. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of celebrities and I, I never liked the idea of just a straight on portrait or, you know, like Warhol did. You know, my thing was to try to show that they were more than what you knew them to be. That Sonia is a black woman, a mother of two sons. She's committed to education, her writing, you know, what does it all reflect? How deep is this woman? And she has so much depth and so much amazing accomplishments. Um, I've been very fortunate that uh, she's a friend and she, she asked me, she said, Alan, she looked at my work. She said, could you come in and do something on my family? And I'll let you go through my family album and you can take whatever you want. And the thing I like about family albums versus taking pictures myself is that they have this aged look about them. They're imperfect. I remember Bearden once said, he said, you know, he doesn't like perfection. You know, and if you look at his collages versus the prints, the collages are somewhat imperfect. The prints are more perfect because the master printer printed them. And he's worried about proficiency and exactness. But that wasn't really Bearden's interest. Next slide, please. Okay, so this was one, uh, the sports teams in Philadelphia, the Eagles and the 76ers when Dr. J was playing for the 76ers and he retired in 87, I did a print of Dr. J. And I tried to show, you know, what he was. He graduated from college. He was a father, you know, yeah, he was a great basketball player, but he had these other interests. He was a more well-rounded person than most people would give him credit for or, or could know because you don't get this stuff revealed to you. Um, this is uh, Irvin Fryer. He was a flanker. He was at the time, he was a member of the Philadelphia Eagles. He was, a, he was their star. He was the, the flanker, the all-star. But he also was a minister. When he finished his professional career, he also graduated from college. And when he finished his professional career, he went in ministry and started a church in New Jersey. So um, I wanted to be able to show him, you see the photograph, you know who he is if you were in Philadelphia at the time, but you see this full person. You know, Barack Obama, um, I did that when he was elected president because for me, uh, it was so much more than just being the first black president. It was the celebration of 200 years since the Slave Act. He was elected in 2008. The Slave Act was something that was an act that was activated, let's say, in, 2000, in 1808, 20 years after the constitution because the Northern states had to concede certain things to the Southern states to allow them to get agreement on the Constitution of the United States. And one of the things they agreed to, they would wait for 20 years before they would put any prohibitions on the import of slaves into the United States. So consequently, when he got elected, that represented a 20 years, a 200 year stretch of our time in this country. What it meant was, if you think about Amistad, the movie, uh, it was about, it was after that period of 1808 when you could not import slaves directly into the United States. You couldn't bring them on a ship and, and land in the United States. So what they did, they took them to Cuba, Havana, Cuba, changed the manifest, and then brought the slave ships up to the United States and they said, oh, it came from Cuba, it didn't come from Africa, so we'll let you in with the slaves. And that's why little, that's why Havana, Cuba became little Africa. Uh, so it's like all this connection. It's like Obama couldn't do this unless there was the Voting Rights Act. He couldn't have done it unless there was a, um, Frederick Douglass. He couldn't have done it. If you look, if you could see this print, I can't blow it up, but there's lines in here. These are not lines. These are names of all the people. And of course, from slavery to Martin Luther King and the vote to Obama, 
three critical points in our history which enable him to happen, to have that happen. Um, but he was, an ed he was educated when, when the, uh, the crash in 2009, he had worked on Wall Street. Obama has so many dimensions to him. And I want to show that by saying, by showing the names of the people that he connected with. He was an author, he had two, you know, best-selling books, you know. He was all of this, then he sings. My God, man, this man was, had to be Superman to be the first one, to be the first African-American. So that's what I try to do. My themes, are, I don't think they're political, they're social narratives. Um, I'm concerned about imagery and I do use photographs to identify with the humanity, but I look at abstraction. I look at uh, things that move. I try to create movement in my work, but not, you know, it, it's, it's kind of lateral. It's like coming at you in, 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 in short waves, uh, like time does, you know. The element of time, I think, is conveyed by the, the uh, resolution of the image. The overlays uh, activate the space with marks uh, and keep a limited palette. Although the one for Obama, I just had to put the, the, the start primary colors in there because there was a lot of bloodshed. You know, this piece is titled Hope and Dreams, by the way. So, um, so I think that's the last slide, uh, Dr. Rollins. Yeah. Okay, so, so here, if you wanna learn more about Brandywine, you wanna learn more about the Artur database, and you wanna learn more about how curators and educators in the field are using it, you can click on to these uh, links and you'll get like a uh, 20 minute presentation on each one. So, um, so that, thank you, that ends my presentation and thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to share about thank my you. life and about what is in the center of my life, which is building an institution that uh, is driven by cultural diversity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Edmonds. I'm gonna stop share uh, and uh, with our remaining time, uh, I want to see if we can get a little conversation going. One of the neat things about the prelude to your talk tonight um, was that um, for those who came in early, there was some conversation going on. And um, there was a, uh, there's a sense of uh, oral story, storytelling that was taking place. Um, let me stop my video. I'm sorry about that. So there's a sense of oral story storytelling taking place, and I and I appreciated that. As a matter of fact, um, Alan Edmonds um, said, and I'm quoting him: "There are stories bound in the work that African American artists do." Um, and so I, I asked the uh, our esteemed artists to uh, share some questions that they might be interested in responding to. But I actually want to pull at um, some of the threads that were already laid out, um, and um, and maybe. Uh, have a little round of a discussion, uh, and then um, if we have any time for the, some of the questions that students have posted, we can get to that, but we'll try to limit this. Um, I noticed that both um, Kevin, uh, Cole, and, um, and Alan uh, just spoke about the idea that they don't do political art, uh, but they do social art. And I'm wondering both Kevin and uh, Alan, Alan, if you could sh uh, elaborate that on, uh, on that just a little bit more, but we have to be brief. Um, uh, that notion that you're doing social art uh, or, or as opposed to political art. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, I'll go first. Um, it's the humanities, the human, humanness of people. Uh, one of the things is that um, the, the hopes and dreams of African-Americans is many, for me, it's no different than Latinos, the Asians, white people. We're all in a human race, we're human beings. And if we can connect on a human level, then we can begin to understand our differences and create some tolerance. Because the idea of being diversity driven was not popular in 1971. You know, a lot of people didn't see how that could address any of the issues of the civil rights movement or the oppression of blacks. But I say this to, to everyone, you can live in your community, 
But to have an impact and grow outside your community, you've got to connect with other communities, you know. And the, and the African-American community has been a lightning rod for the thinking and the political strategies of these other communities of color, because we are the ones that have been on the front line taking the pain and, 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 and all the uh, attention. But the Latina community, the uh, Asian community, which has grown since the Vietnam War, I'll take it from there from 1971, um, they're all over the country. Blacks are all over the country, you know, and um, the more we interact with one another, the better we can, we can deal with the issues. Um, we're a divided country right now. And I think the only thing that can really work to bring us together is art and culture. I always look at, um, you know, our singers, Beyonce for one, you know, Michael Jackson, they transcended their race because people love their music and the mucus is celebrated and experienced all over the world. Mm -hmm. Music has this ability to exist in the air. Art doesn't, but yet art isn't everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we're working on a project right now about the Silk Road and the impact that the Silk Road and that path for commerce from the East to the West created in culture in the West, which then was the basic foundation of the United States. But now we're, we're you know, we're our architecture, everything. But now we're, we're in this global situation. And I like, I would like for my community to embrace their identity as a black community, but also to think that they're part of the global community. And, and let's make some of these connections so that we can gain strength and, and do the change that we really need to make, which is, which is systematic and it can't be done in a black community alone. Mm -hmm. We have to have partners. Right. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask a similar question to Kevin Cole. Um, uh, talk about a little bit about the, the, the social orientation of your work, but also I'm going to ask you a second question, which is, do you think an art educator needs to be an artist as well? Well, I think that when you, when I always tell people, when you first look at my work besides the, uh, the new Jim Crow series, when you look at the work, a lot of people say, well, you know, I see these ties or I see these scarf shapes, okay? If you don't know the meaning behind them, you just see them as paintings of beauty. Or so, say, mm -hmm. you know, oh, oh, he used color real, real well. He used this real, real well. But then when you, when you look be beneath the surface, I'm addressing a social, uh, social, uh, sub something social that, that, I, that have caught my attention. I mean, that example, there are several images that I didn't show. I, I, did, a, a, I did a series of works uh, that spoke about, uh, excuse me, Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. okay? And the, the piece, they, they were fairly conceptual. And I did these silhouettes, I did these ladders for Trayvon that um, George Zimmerman made the comment, but they always get away. Mm -hmm. I named the piece, but not Trayvon. Mm -hmm. And but they always get away it has 17 letters in it. Tray Trayvon Martin was 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just think that when, when you look at it, even though I use every medium I use as it do with the 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 social political event. Example: When you think about September 11, the reason I'm using aluminum and tar paper is uh, when you look at those buildings, it was a lot of a lot of uh, bit steel there. But instead of using steel, I'm using aluminum. It, it, there was a lot of tar paper and debris around. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other question, should our teachers be uh, uh, artists? I think, they, I think they should do artwork, number one. I can't say that they should be artists because everybody, even I've noticed as an AP, I serve as consultant for the college board for, for 20 some years. And I found that the art teachers they're continuing doing their work. Their, their students have better AP scores. Mm -hmm. At my first school, I, I had a 94% pass rate. My second school, I had a 97% pass rate. When I retired, I had a 100% pass rate of my students at, at that school mm -hmm. because they saw me doing art and I was able to introduce them to other artists. So I tell teachers that, that you may want to think about, do, even if you don't show your work, do your work because mm -hmm. you learn through a process of doing. 
Mm -hmm. And you teach them, teach them how to learn the process of doing. Okay. Um, I, I got one, I have one question uh, for uh, Stephen, uh, Steve, and, uh, and then we'll uh, to turn it over to our organizers just in case they have student questions, because I see a lot loading up in the chat. Um, uh, one of the things I was uh, struck by, Stephen, is, um, is a sense of, uh, uh, by the way, I got your reference about Harvey Picard. I'm a, I'm a fan, <laughs> so I, I, I went and got it. Um, but um, there's this tremendous sense of legacy in your, in your work. Um, uh, uh, it was uh, struck by how many of your subjects were former teachers and how many of your subjects were uh, former students. Um, now, now adults or, or you know, at different variations, different points, you, you caught them and captured their stories. But in all these cases, you were capturing stories. Um, and I wanna ask you a question. Um, uh, what do you think your responsibility is as an artist um, as you share with the public at large um, these very intimate life details, these intimate aspects of storytelling in the lives of your subjects? So I want to kind of tie into what Mr. Cole and Mr. Edmonds mentioned uh, about having a purpose mm -hmm. and thinking through what you're doing. Um, people, so, so when I would do these interviews, people were very comfortable and people, but what was going to be a, a single question ended up being an hour, hour and a half and we're taking the whole time. There was never any guard put up. And so when that's given to me and I'm using that as source material, I, it, there has to be responsible sourcing. Um, I had stuff that I've erased. Mm -hmm. I've had things that people have sat here, given me everything, we cried together, that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. they've come back a couple of weeks later and said, you know, I'm not comfortable sharing. I mean, you and I, we're good. And so I don't think it's, ethically responsible for me to just say, oh, well, I've got it now. And then I've got to make some decisions about what, because art is powerful, right? I've got to make decisions about what's going to happen and, and how it's going to affect things. And uh, and please forgive me if I'm wrong, Mr. Cole, I believe you, you mentioned something that to me kind of equates to making work and, and chasing something as opposed to making work. Like you, I think like you were saying, it's important for you to make art because understand that making art and being an artist and some of the business and, the, and that sort of thing and you start chasing profit, those are two different things, right? So if you commit to chasing profits, then you will inevitably, you know, sell out. Uh, example would be this. I had, a, I had a student who knew about the work I was making, really wanted to talk to me, her and her mother. Her and her mother would have spit an image of each other with one difference. She was extremely light. Her mother was a very chocolate, dark skinned woman because her mother, uh, she was a product of an interracial marriage. And so I went to their house. She, they invited me to their home. I set up all my camera, my lighting, we mic up, they're interviewing. And at some point, because the conversation goes in different places, um, somehow we got onto the subject of how some African American women take issue with African-American men who do not date other African-American women. And so as we're having that conversation, the daughter starts pointing at the mother. And so I said, oh, well, what's going on? And so mom was like, okay, I admit it. I have a problem with it. I stopped the tape and said, okay, what? I'm sorry, you, you got to explain this to me because there's evidence beside you that, <laughs> you know, so she said that she had a real problem with African-American men who would date outside of their race, in particular, white women. And so I just kind of scratched my head like, well, but so it's OK for you and not for someone else. And how do you even know what per you know, we don't know why people are together. It has nothing to do with any of that. And so I tell that story and not on purpose, leave their names out of it. I never made a single piece of it because I could have very easily made pieces. I had it all on tape, and, but that would have vilified someone and it would have taken attention away from the conversation I wanted to have. I want to have conversations about why we are putting up this caste system within our own community, knowing our history within this country. 
-hmm. And so you, you don't, you don't want to cloud that. So yes, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility, even if, if you're given something, it's more than this, oh, I'm going to make all this great work. No, you need to think about it and what it means and the ramifications of what it means. I mean, if Mr. Edmonds is just chasing a dollar, then he's missing something, right? He's got all this rich stuff. If Mr. Cole is chasing a dollar, he's putting out some things, some stories, some things for people to think about, to, to, to say something like, there's a reason for the materials and you need to know that. Now, yes, we all need to survive and make money and that sort of thing, but there's got to be a balance. There's got to be, because if not, you know, uh, quoting Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> well, I, 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 on that <laughs> note, uh, thank you, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cozart, Mr. Edmonds. Um, I do thank you for your time uh, and for your commitment uh, and for your work, uh, uh, which is... Uh, such a value. I'm going to turn it because of the time, 7.56, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, our organizer, uh, Joanna Spitzner, to see how she wants to handle the next few minutes. Um, thank you, all of you. This is, uh, It's been a really great discussion to see your work. Um, we really don't have a lot of time. I might, um, if you can allow me maybe one question. I'm going to try to combine a couple, but mm -hmm. um, one student asked, as an education major, I'm often taught about teacher-student and teacher-parent boundaries. Would you say, uh, so this is in relation to Steve, but I think it could be with all of you, like how, how did the work affect your boundaries or do things get complicated when teacher-student relationship overlaps with artist-subject relationships? Mm -hmm. And I wanna kind of bring this out a little bit back to Alan about institutions. So I'm wondering, right, these are institutional relationships, but I think you're all kind of extending what, what they could be, right? And what that sense of community is. And I hope that's a correct um, connection. But Steve, why don't we start with you about sort of bringing your students and their parents into your work and how that's affected your relationship as a teacher? So for me, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. been a it's been a good thing. Um, nobody's, I don't actively seek them. Every student, every parent um, that has come to me, that's a, that ends up ultimately being a subject, they have sought me out. And I've been very upfront with them and said, this is what I'm gonna do. This is how I'm gonna do it. Are you comfortable? And then I'm just very careful to make sure that they are in control of what what is happening in regard to what is revealed, because I'm just I know I see myself as a conduit. They 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 got something they got to get out. They're coming to me because they see me as a way to get that out, and that has to be respected. And if that's respected, you still maintain that boundary, that relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then Alan, I'm having trouble answering this one because. The, the only relationship I ever had with the students was, um, you know, the parents' expectation and the parents' value for the students' interest in the arts. You know, most of my students were of color and the valuation of a career in the arts wasn't very high. So they looked at me as a disruptor. If I was turning into art, I was disrupting the pattern or plan that they had for the students. And therefore I became dangerous, you know? So I kept distances with parents. Okay, well, I guess that's to me, I'm, I'm gonna use an example. I taught, I taught advanced placement and advanced placement, a student had to do a series of works that, that dealt with their philosophy. For example, this young lady did a series of works based on feminine protection. So she was doing uh, tampons and things of, things of that nature, okay? And to make a long story short, her dad was a, 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 a attorney. So anyway, anyway, she did a good job. She got a, a five on a, on a portfolio. So her dad kept saying, I can't hang this in the house. So I had the students to uh, write tampons and send them photographs. They bought the whole portfolio. The dad loved me. The dad loved me. <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but I've always involved the parents because the parents, um, a lot of them, because I, I was at the magnet program, they were supposed to be it was the math science program. But when the dad, dad to, to this very day, he'll, he'll see me, he'll say, you know what? You saved my life. 
Well, we have run out of time and I, I'm sorry that we have. I feel like uh, we have lots of questions, but I do, I, James, thank you so much for organizing this and um, the depth of the history and community and, and sense of both tragedy and hope you've all shared with us tonight has been really um, incredible. So thank you again. And I'm really honored to be, have a small part in this. Um, so thank you and have a good evening, everyone. Thank, thank you so much. Take care. Uh, gentlemen, it was an honor being on this panel. Thank you so much. Steve, thank I'm going to be in touch.